except for Treasurer Slavin. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Can I have a motion to adopt the agenda? I move we adopt the agenda. Support. Moved by Trustee Snydeman, supported by Trustee Foster. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Let's all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great, thank you. So the only item we have on the agenda today is the study ses session, dispatch supervision and staffing, and we will be led by I'm, I'm going to lead Chief Chad. Yep, I'm going to lead today. And uh, ready? Yes. All right. I have uh, a lot of people here in support with the Public Safety Department, and this has been spearheaded not only by um, Barb but Erica. Um, she is a dispatch supervisor currently, and she'll be moving over to the fire department. So we congratulate her in her, her new role. We have Captain um, Captain Biley did a lot of work on the back end. And of course, in what you'll see throughout this process, uh, what probably goes on, unsaid is a lot of the advances, not only in the police side, but on the fire side. And Deputy Chief Strasner has really put forth a lot of effort and the professionalism over the last, I don't know how many years, you'll see it in the update, but it's probably five or six years of a lot of advancing uh, over the last five or six years with our medical response. And of course, a former PSSO and now our fire chief, Chris Stockline, and uh, we talk a lot about that. I know it was a short period of your career, but that context can help all of us look at this information as we uh, present it to the board tonight. So, um, and of course, I've been here 28 years. I've seen uh, many different uh, looks in that dispatch area, and right now I think it's good to be transparent and bring it forth to the board to understand the context of their work. Um, so our current model right now, as you see with the first slide, um, is the, I, I have it here. Um, we have two dispatch supervisors in our, in our dispatch area, and they came um, through a, a change in how we handled our dispatching. Uh, the, uh, prior to 2017, the, the direct supervision occurred with our sergeants and our lieutenants on the police side and battalion chiefs, I believe, and over the years might have been captains. I don't remember all the different ranks over the years, but there was a lot of coordinated effort. But based on the, not only the professionalism, but the demand of our township as we grew, we recognized back then that we needed some dispatch, dispatch supervisors. And you'll see in, in the slides, you may have already seen them, uh, that the staffing level is 18, and that's been, we believe going back to 2002 uh, was the last time we've addressed our dis dispatch staffing, and you're gonna see their population growth and all the things that you're faced with today as a board in other arenas of this township and how we grew so fast. It's really directly impacted um, how we handle dispatching too because of the increased workload. Um, during that time, it was uh, when we created these two positions, we had a IT supervisor, uh, for lack of better terms, it was the, the, the title for um, Stacy before she left. What was her uh, title? Systems coordinator. Systems coordinator. So we split those two, and Erica and Chris performed both the function of dispatch supervision and dispatch supervision and the um, uh, the IT support for all the systems. You're going to see tonight just the, the the vast volume of work that goes around supporting how many systems we have functioning at the same time for our dispatchers. So what we're getting at, the bottom line, is the increased responsibilities for both the IT components of the dispatch area and the dispatch supervisors is quite, quite large. So if you would, next slide. So I'm going to hand it over to Barb to give us a little background here. Thank you. My glasses on here. Um, first of all, just to clarify, um, Canton Administrative ITI will still continue to maintain and support all of the township computers, which would be our desktops, our Microsoft programs, Tyler, Workforce Dimensions, things of that nature. Everything we're talking about tonight is in addition to that. Um, we feel at this time it's the best operational interest of our department to move forward with a dedicated IT person just for public safety. Um, we have estimated our equipment right now to be just over $4 million. 
and that is made up of hardware, software, service agreements, and licensing fees. Um, to give some examples of our hardware right now, we have our um, very expansive dispatch console, which consists of our 911 system, our 800 megahertz radios, CAD and Clemis, and then all of our recording equipment for the phone lines and for the radios. We have an extensive um, inventory of radios. Every officer and firefighter is assigned a portable, and every car is equipped with a um, mounted radio inside of it. Additional vehicle technology, we have um, modems and laptops in almost all the vehicles. We have in-car printers for the police cars and in-car cameras. And then at our fire stations, we have status monitors for BRICS and CAD dispatching programs. And then, of course, in our buildings, we have our security cameras and all of our key card access systems. All of that's running through this position. Software um, is really managing all of the licensing renewal, software upgrades, user training. Um, we have a lot of secured um, access programs, so he restricts the use on those and monitors it, and then any state auditing programs he's uh, responsible for. He, she. To, to piggyback what Barb said, I, I think it's important. Oh, uh, I was walking through the hallway not too long ago, and and Victor caught me, our ITI director, and he's like, Chad, did you, what are you gonna do? Because Erica's now moving on their fireside, and I think he was just told, very concerned about the amount of work that's gonna be left for just Chris when he's trying to supervise dispatch at the same time. So it's, it's a concern, um, not only on our side, but uh, Victor also thought we may have missed it, but it was, I'm glad he and I are both thinking the same thing, and I know Chris supports it. So that was a good catch by Victor. Um, and so in addition to managing all of that equipment, this position also does the troubleshooting and is expected to resolve all the issues that arise from this technology. For the most part, everything runs pretty smoothly with proper setup and maintenance, but we have over 200 users in police and fire, so issues do arise on a pretty frequent basis. Um, currently, the biggest issues come from the body cameras, the aging building security camera systems that we have, and then, of course, the... Um, modems and laptops in all the moving vehicles. They pose a continual problem. And then lastly, this position um, participates in the project management. We are a um, technology-driven department, so his role in any construction, uh, renovation, security problems going forward, he will be um, definitely involved in. <laughs> and then last, um, this position we are proposing would be continue to be funded based on workload, which is 70% police and 30% fire. Chinese vehicle. <laughs> you didn't see anything. Sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, again, Captain Joe Biley from the police department. Thank you for creating the space for us this time to be able to present this to you. So some of the responsibilities of the dispatch supervisor has grown throughout the years, and I'll go through some of the list here. Direct and supervise the work of employees assigned to the communication center. We currently have 18 dispatchers that work four different shifts, and so they're responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of that. Ensure proper staffing levels of the communication centers for 24-hour seven coverage. And so, again, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we have a minimum of two at least sitting in that room. And so you can imagine the type of scheduling challenges that presents us. We do that, again, for quality of service and for safety reasons for our officers. Coordinate, train, and implement policy and, tr and procedure changes. So coordinate and train 10 to 15 years ago wasn't as grand as it is now. And you can imagine as society has, has grown and we've had to adapt and change the need for training. You see it in the news all the time. How are we training? One of the big things that we've implemented in our organization is the crisis intervention team. So the crisis intervention team is mobile for our officers, but what we realized very quickly is that dispatch is truly the front door to that house. It's their first contact, and so we now send our dispatchers to a 48-hour class to be crisis intervention trained, and what they're trained to be able to do is stabilize that caller and to get good information. Um, one of the things we talk about is garbage in, garbage out, and so if we have bad information coming in, it's not quality, that information is getting passed off to our officers, and you can imagine how dangerous that is, or even the fire department. So the dispatch's job is to truly be able to set that table as best as it can for public safety to respond. And what we found is crisis intervention training has worked for us to be able to stabilize, get good information, and get a good response to the, to the run. 
48 hours of training, again, talking about scheduling, you can imagine the impact it has to the scheduling, especially when we have minimums of two people in the room at all times. Um, again, talk about supervise and coordinate new hire training. We have a very aggressive onboarding program that we do, and that again is to maintain the standards of our dispatchers. Implement dispatch console radio template updates. Technology um, for the public is just as the same as it is for the, the Department of uh, Public Safety. It's always changing, so we always have to update. And with any update, we have to learn how to be able to implement it. Track dispatcher training funds and submit annual reports to the state 911 committee. So we always make sure that we're being uh, budget uh, mindful, right? We wanna make sure that we're getting the most bang out of our buck and that we're always watching what we're doing, um, quality training versus quantity, and we're making sure it fits within our budget restraints. Mm -hmm. Track dispatcher, sorry, conduct internal investigations, um, evaluate evaluations and investigations. And so when we talk about where is this dispatcher position gonna go later on, one of the things that we're looking to do is to bring the dispatch supervisor group into our command group and it, it, on the onset, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it does when you start looking at quality of our dispatchers and the quality of work product. Internal investigations is what maintains a lot of that. And so currently right now, uh, Erica is in a, in a, a, on a level with them. And so if they become a supervisor, now they have ability to be able to hand out disciplines or do anything now. What, what they're doing right now is they'll do the internal, then it goes off to another supervisor, which is usually a non-dispatcher person then they want up handing the discipline down. So we're looking to try and close that gap. It helps our employee group too to have somebody that can relate to them better and understand some of the stresses that they're going through. I'll openly admit, I could not sit in their chair and do their job and it's, uh, it's tough for me to be able to judge them accurately when we're looking at discipline. Payroll approval for all PSOs and PSAs, point of contact for department, procedures and state 911 committee audits. Those audits are very lengthy, but they're necessary, and uh, they kind of they pop up unexpected quite a bit. We just had one a little while ago, and it's time consuming for them. Work with various vendors to resolve issues related to mission critical dispatch equipment. Again, just like anything else, our equipment times out. Our prep radios right now are towards the end of lifespan, so we're looking at new prep radios. Communicate with members of various township departments to resolve issues related to the communications center. We're always trying to learn from other who's doing it better, how can we do it better, and so we try and communicate with our partners in the community. One of the things that does is build bridges for us. You look at Plymouth Canton Schools District, if we ever have an event there, we are going to rely on our partners at Plymouth, Dearborn, different communities, because we, we experienced that with the lockdown last year where the 911 center became inundated with phone calls. We only have four people sitting in that room. They can only take so many calls. So we have to divert to other communities. So we always make sure that we keep those uh, relationships healthy. Hey, Joe, I have a question too. If we had this consideration approved by the board allowing um, for that framework to take place with the supervisors, they can move right into the dispatch and actually do the work too. Is that not correct? So I'll, uh, I'll go into a bit of a the history back for me, how this came about. So last year we had the flooding. If everyone remembers the, the streets flooded heavily. It was last year or the year before. Canton Center flooded. We literally had fish on Canton Center. I've never seen that before. Mm -hmm. So distress pages start going out for police officers. We need officers and officers. And so after the second or third one, I call in the dispatch. It took me a couple times to get in there. And what, what's going on? Mass flooding throughout the township. Okay, fine. So I'm on the way. So I come in and Canton Center again is flooded and we have a dispatcher who lives in the township who is responding to it. She does not see the flood, drives into the flood and she disables her vehicle. It gets flooded. Gives enough just to get into the bushes parking lot. The dispatcher gets out of the car, wades through the water and goes from bushes all the way to the police department because she knew she had to get herself in that seat to be able to help with the calls that are coming in. So I come in, I see my dispatcher who's soaking wet, <laughs> um, and Erica is there, and they're just trying to do their best to stem the tide, if you will, of runs that are in calls that are coming in. And so as I'm watching all this going on and trying to provide them resources, I realize that we're just overwhelmed right now. And then I also realize that Erica isn't getting paid for this. She's here on her own time. And Erica was here very, very late. During that same time, Dearborn became overwhelmed with their flooding too. We are the backup for Dearborn. Dearborn is, um, it's regional, so it's Dearborn, it's Wayne, it's a couple other communities. So we're taking our, their piece of their pie too. And the room just became overwhelmed and I'm watching all this happening and I'm thinking this isn't Canton. It's just, it's just not, it's not the Canton that I know. 
we have to be able to do something to do better. And so for me, that's where it began, working with the fire department, trying to figure out how do we, how do we fix this thing? And, and with Erica's position, her being there for free, she was there till, you were there till late that night. Um, into the next morning. Into the next morning, because there's just a lot of stuff that's going on and we had dispatchers coming in. And so that's where that really came from as we talk about a butt in the seat. Um, I did, I watched Erica and I thought, doggone, we gotta do better. So that's where that came from. So dispatcher supervisor training oversight, 2017 to 2023. So 2017, we had a record supervisor that handled all of our training. And so training is a bit lengthy. You set up the class, you gotta find it, you gotta get any, um, any type of transportation, um, Tyler, go through all the billing and everything. Well, that position has now moved on, and so it went to the dispatch supervisors now. So they handle for 18 different people all the different certificates and all of their training. And you see that in the 2023 column, coordinate PSO and PSA new hire training. PSAs are our public safety aides, commonly recalled as, uh, called cadets. They're uh, an entry point to our organization. Report use of dispatcher training funds to the state. Again, the state monitors us constantly. We're always reporting to them, as we should. Monitor and manage all EMD and EFD certifications for all 18 employees. You have to have those certifications to be able to sit in that chair and answer runs. If they lapse, you cannot sit in that chair. Coordinate blue card light training for all of our dispatchers, which is, which is very lengthy. So that brings us into span of control, which is the world that I live in, is when I look at our organization and our structure, I'm always looking for patterns and practices and things that we can do to make sure that we're reducing organizational liability. And one of the things I look at is span of control. Am I putting our supervisors in the best position to succeed by giving them a, a relatively good amount of employees to monitor? So back in 2017, we had 18 full-time PSSOs. We had no part-time employees. So our span of control with two supervisors is about one to nine, which, is, which isn't too bad. Well now fast forward to 2023, we've developed our public safety aid program. We've added 10, we're currently at 14 right now, and we still have our 18. So the span of control for me has become very worrisome. It's overtaxing for them to be able to watch all of these different people. And the PSA group, again, is a developmental group for our organization. Typically we're looking for that student that's right out of high school, that person that's interested in the fire department or interested in the police department. Well, you can imagine you get a lot of 18 year olds together and you give them the responsibility of monitoring a jail, which again is high liability for our organization. And I begin to worry about our span of control issues. Again, high area of liability. I just want to touch on a couple things that Captain Biley mentioned. First one is, is that this dispatch supervisor position, I don't know where we would be currently if we didn't have a dispatch supervisor role. Uh, the fire department is just an agency of initiative. We are always looking for ways to improve. And prior to the dispatch supervisor role here, we had um, was a police sergeant at the time probably that was in charge of dispatch. So if we had an issue or an initiative that we wanted to start, a single station toning initiative, or hey, this dispatcher didn't do an emergency medical dispatch process correctly, we didn't really have a means to to, to go through to uh, fix the situation. Yeah, we could have went through the sergeant and he could have went and talked to the, to the, the dispatcher and say, the fire department's got a problem with how you did this, right? But there was no follow through, there was no follow up at the time. So just having that dispatch supervisor position that knows how to be a, a dispatcher and understands what the fire department needs is ultra important to us. I don't know whether we could actually be as successful as we've been without having that person in that role to make sure that dispatch functions as the fire department needs to. I mean, years ago, we'll talk about a little bit later, we used to use just the metal flip cards when we would, someone would call in and say, hey, I need, I need an ambulance at this address. And they would flip through a medical guide card that says, all right, you, you should do this. And the person's reading this on this little guide card and it never really flowed great, but it was something that we had to have to be a 911 center at the time. Well, since then, we've upgraded to a priority dispatch system that's computer-based and really is more in line with, uh, well, current uh, protocol. It's followed by a medical director, and it is probably the best, most recognizable emergency medical dispatch system there is. 
So we have the best. It's just getting everyone trained, which was something else that Captain Barley had mentioned. The training on this is uh, immense. So is the upfront training just to get someone through all of the certifications to even, to even perform the emergency medical dispatch process. And then uh, finally, he also had mentioned Blue Card Light. Blue Card Light is, again, it's another initiative that I don't know how successful we would be at getting implemented prior to the supervisor role. And Blue Card is a communication model that the fire department uses on a fire scene to be sure that we're all talking the same language. And you, it's, it's really demonstrated when we go on a real simple fire alarm at like, say, maybe like a Walmart. And this engine will get on scene and they'll, they'll provide basic information about the Walmart structure and they'll actually take command of the Walmart fire alarm, which sounds really overkill, really, because it's just a fire alarm. There's really no actual fire at that Walmart, but it's a muscle memory activity so that when it is the real situation, they, they handle it effectively. And dispatch, their, their part in that is they're always listening and we put them through the blue card light training so that they are informed and know why this, this fire captain is taking control of a Walmart where there's no issue there, right? It seems a little bit um, too much, but those are just some of my perspectives on why the dispatch supervision uh, position is just so darn important to the fire department. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So the last slide is dispatcher supervisor funding. The two new positions created as part of the Canton Command Officer Bargaining Unit. And I talked earlier about that. Um, primarily, it's to have consistency in that room. And the internal affairs is one of the bigger components of that. And it's also, the truth of the matter is, is we're going to have incidents like that, that flooding, where I want the dispatch supervisors to be able to sit there, have all the training, and be able to actually answer the runs and relieve some of the pressure to the room as we call in more dispatchers from, from out. And that's why we expanded our dispatch center. Instead of four seats, we now have six, so we can grow as the incidents unfold. The finance uh, reviewing feasible by 911 funds and for salaries. Thank you. It's working. Maybe. Thank you all for your time. I appreciate you being here um, and giving us this time to give you our perspective on our staffing levels. I'm going to go over our current PSSO staffing levels and our need for additional staffing. If you look at the graph here, we have the population of Canton, which I'm sure everyone knows has been growing over the years, uh, from 2000 to 2020. We are a booming community. We haven't stopped growing once. Um, I've grown up in Canton, so I've definitely seen the development, both residential and commercial sides of it. And you really, really see it when you're in public safety because you see the amount of calls, the run volume increasing, and everything along with the technology and the need for these additional um, assistance. The second graph has public safety staffing. The last time we saw PSSO staffing increase was 2002, which is when we went to 18. In 2002, you can see the numbers that we have. The red line is for the firefighters and the gold line is for the police officers. We moved to 2010, dispatcher staffing stays the same. Both police and fire increase their staffing. And if we look at our current staffing levels, dispatch is still at 18, police and fire has increased. Police and fire staffing needed to increase because of our population increase, um, because of our commercial increase. It's not just the uh, citizens that live in Canton, but we also have people that work in Canton, people that shop in Canton, people that come to our soccer tournaments, people that come to Liberty Fest. Uh, the numbers increase, um, but we have not seen any staffing as far as the PSSOs. The nice thing is with our new center, um, prior to the new center, we only had the four workstations, which would have made a increasing staffing very challenging because we wouldn't have people to actually uh, anywhere for them to actually work at. So now that we have our nice new center, it's amazing. I love it. Thank you to anyone who has helped get us that center as well. Um, we are up to six workstations, which means that we can, this is a perfect time for us to look at our staffing levels and our needs and to actually have that space for additional people to work. This slide has some of the responsibilities of the PSSO position that have been added over the past 20 years. Um, I can tell you back in 2004 when I started as a PSSO, things were a lot simpler, but I was still terrified in that room. It didn't matter. I was answering 911 calls. I knew the responsibility that I had, um, and it weighed on me heavily because I knew if I did something incorrectly, a citizen could get hurt, a police officer could get hurt, a firefighter could get hurt. Um, 
the tools that we had to keep everyone safe. It was a, a phone, um, a radio, and a very basic computer-aided dispatch program. As we move through the years, technology advances. Everyone knows that we get the new, the, the better, the more advanced technology in the center. Especially in the past, I'd say, six years, we have definitely improved in our technology and our procedures. A couple things that um, we've added is the single station toning. Uh, the Deputy Fire Chief kind of touched on that a little bit. When I started, we toned out all three fire stations. We pushed one button, an alarm went off at all three fire stations over the overhead speakers, woke them up in the middle of the night, and I would say central dispatch to all stations. Uh, we have a medical, so we have a medical run. I'm gonna wake up the entire fire department and say, okay, I need you to go here for whatever the medical issue is. And then they would have to figure out which unit was gonna go, and then finally everyone else could go back to sleep once those units were en route. So that wears on our firefighters. I'm not sure if anyone's ever had a newborn at home. Hmm. You're waking up every hour, every two hours because that baby's crying. Um, maybe your partner is there to help you and the baby cries though and you're gonna wake up. It doesn't matter. You hear that noise and it is jarring. Um, that's similar to the toning situation that we had previously where we woke everyone up, the people that needed to handle it did, and then everyone else was able to fall asleep but then you were never in that sound sleep. You can never get back to that state again. With the new toning system, we only tone out one fire station. Uh, that is a huge impact on the health of our firefighters, being able to be well rested. That's gonna impact the service that they can provide to our citizens. They're gonna be more alert. Uh, there's less liability. All around, everyone benefits from this system. But as everyone benefits, that also adds more responsibilities onto our dispatchers. In 2017, we went to the single station toning, so rather than push that one button and say your spiel, you had to look at the computer. It would give you recommendations. You'd find what stations each of those units were coming out of. You'd look at your radios. You'd patch your primary radio channel to the specific stations that you were trying to tone out, and then you could dispatch it. And you don't have a minute to do this. You have a couple of seconds because that person, that citizen, they need help, and they need help as fast as possible. So no one can... Um, be late, no one can delay. There's extra stress on that dispatcher. There's extra responsibilities on that dispatcher. In 2018, this great technology called Rapid SOS was introduced. Rapid SOS is a free service provided to communication centers. And it is amazing what we can do with this program. When someone calls 911, we get their location. If they're on a landline, we get the address that they're at. If they're calling on a cell phone, it depends on the service that they have. That could come in as a what we call a phase one call, which would just give us the address of a tower that that cell phone is coming off of, which doesn't give us a great location for the caller. So if that 911 caller can't give us their location specifically, we are trying to find them by the location of that tower. It could give us a phase two, which gives us a better location of the caller, but not extremely accurate. Rapid SOS takes that 911 caller and it pulls their location from the Internet of Things. So it's looking at Wi-Fi signals, it's looking at um, LTE signals, it's looking at your smartwatch, your tablets, and it's pulling all that information and it's narrowing down your location. If you see the map on Rapid SOS when you get a 911 call, it can narrow it down to a house. So rather than saying this 911 call is coming in from a half mile radius from this point, I'm not sure where that person is at, I can say, According to Rapid SOS, it's giving me this house address as a very possible location. Obviously, that's, that's huge for us. If we have someone that can't communicate with us and we need to get them help, now we have great location services from the service. I talked to our customer service rep for Rapid SOS, who handles, I believe, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana. She said, of all the communication centers in Michigan, we are number two in utilization of this program. And they look at utilization by the number of clicks. So that means a 911 call comes in, our dispatchers are going to this separate program, they're looking at the location. Rapid SOS also provides medical information if people choose to sus um, subscribe to it. So then they can click into another area and they can find medical information. There are over 20 apps that interact with Rapid SOS, like Uber. So if you were to call 911 through the Uber app, it will give the driver um, information of that vehicle, it will give the color and make of the vehicle. It gives us all this great information that we can use to help save people. 
and get them the help that they need as quickly as possible. But it all takes time. And it's something that we have to do because we have to be able to provide the service. We want to be able to help people. The feeling that you have of helplessness, being that person on the phone trying to find that location, used to be incredible. It would give you so much anxiety not being able to find that caller. And the fact that we have this technology, it's amazing. Um, our dispatchers can't live without this. Sorry to interrupt your role. What happens too is there's an element of crime analysis and analysis done by dispatch. So their partners are also working in the background with our, um, our records management system, cross-referencing all that information to help the officers and firefighters in the field. So I don't know if you can explain a little bit how that works, but how the communication and the partnership works. Um, safety is huge, public safety, right? So the safety of our first responders is also very important to us. So there, we need to gather so much information before our first responders actually arrive on scene. So it's not just getting the location, getting the caller's name and sending them on their way. Domestic violence situations are incredibly dangerous for our first responders. So we wanna make sure that they have as much information before they arrive there as possible. So while you're the call taker, your partners in the room are also searching out information with you. They're trying to find uh, previous incidents at this address, if there's any officer safety issues, if there are any guns registered to the people that are involved in the situation, if people have any warrants that maybe like there's something with resisting or obstructing police officers. Our officers and our fire department needs to know that before they arrive on scene so they can mentally prepare and form a plan before entering that residence and making contact with those people. And searching out all that information is done really through a team effort. A lot of times people look at communication centers and they see a police dispatcher and a fire dispatcher and a call taker and that's the very bare minimum. What our dispatchers do is investigative work before that responder arrives in sometimes a minute, three minutes, they are always on it. They're not sitting there and they're taking a break and letting their partners handle it. They're all working together to find this information and keep people as safe as possible. Uh, 2019, we went to Priority Dispatch, which is our EMD, which is the Emergency Medical Dispatch and Emergency Fire Dispatch protocols. Previously, we, we had APCO and it was just the medical protocols. So we expanded to fire as well. The great thing about Priority Dispatch is it standardizes care. So while we had the flip cards where we could flip and you kind of pick out a couple things that applied to the situation, Priority Dispatch has the dispatcher open up a protocol and they have to go through all the same questions with everyone. They're not picking and choosing. That means if you have a 20 year dispatcher with experience or you have a brand new dispatcher, they're gonna get the same information from you and they're gonna provide the same pre-arrival instructions, which means they're gonna tell you the same thing that they're gonna tell the next caller. Um, of course, it's gonna depend on the protocol that you're in. Is it an issue with chest pain? Is the person having difficulty breathing? There's different questions for every protocol, but no one is going to get a quick, okay, turn on your lights and we'll be there in a minute. They are going to get instructions and they are gonna stay on that phone with that caller. One of the issues though is that that takes time. We want to be able to provide the best customer service possible. We want to standardize care. We want everyone to get the same services. But that takes time on our dispatchers. They have to stay on the lines longer. And when we do have higher call volumes, at times those calls have to be put on hold so that another 911 call can be answered and then they go back to those original calls. But we never want to just cut a call short because we don't have the time. Uh, 2021, we upgraded our text 911 to a system called Texty. So text 911 is another way to reach 911 when you can't call, you text. And it is very important, um, especially for sometimes more like teenagers. Teenagers don't like to call. They like to text. They like to text each other, their friends, their parents. So texting is something that they're more familiar with. So that we give them another avenue for contacting 911 if they don't feel comfortable talking to someone on the phone. Texty gave us the ability to initiate texts. So previously text 911, someone had to text 911 in order for us to have a two-way conversation with them. But with Texty, we can start that text message conversation. So if you have a runaway juvenile who's scared, who doesn't want to answer the phone for a number that they don't know, such as the police department, you can send them a text, they can read the text, and then you can start a conversation with them in a, in a format that they're more comfortable with. And we've had good success with actually getting people to respond to our texts, whereas with phone calls, they don't necessarily answer them. Now, to be honest, if I don't have uh, 
any idea who that number is, I'm not answering it either. So I completely understand. <laughs> but if I have a text, I'll read a text, and I may ignore it, or I may not. Uh, another service that Texty came with was language translations, which is a great help. So if we have a, a service called Language Line, so that brings an interpreter onto a phone call with us. But if we're talking to somebody through text, this gives us an automatic translation. We'll select the language. We type it in English. It translates it and sends it in the language that we selected. And then when they send it to us in the language that they speak, it translates it automatically to English. So that gives us another means to talk to people where if communication barriers exist, this is breaking down some of those barriers. But again, it's more responsibilities, more things that people have to keep an eye on. The text to 911 has to be monitored 24 seven because we can't miss one of those. It's as important as a 911 call. Um, and then looking in 2023, previously we had four positions. We now have six workstation positions. When I started, we had three screens to look at. Now we've gone to eight screens. So we have definitely expanded. It's, it is brighter in that room now than it has ever been. <laughs> They like to work with the lights low because they are literally surrounded by screens that they need to monitor 24-7. Um, we need it because we have so many systems that we need to keep up. We need to watch everything. Um, the phone is on the computer. The radio is on the computer. Our, our security systems on the computer. Our text 911 is on the computer. Our computer-aided dispatch is on the computer. Um, everything that needs to be monitored, they need to have access to all the time. Um, but again, that just kind of shows the additional responsibilities that have happened throughout the years. <clears throat> this slide here highlights our call volume. So 21% of our calls are 911 calls, and then 79% of our calls are non-emergency or administrative calls. So our 911 calls are the ones we're trying to get help to people to as quickly as possible. They're calling, they have some kind of emergency, we want to provide services. Those calls tend to be a little bit shorter because we are trying to get the responder there as soon as possible. Once that responder's on scene, then we can disconnect the call. Our non-emergency calls, we're spending more time on those calls with people. They may be calling for directions. They may be calling to ask about Liberty Fest. They may be calling to ask about prisoners that are in custody. <laughs> um, so we tend to use, spend a little bit more time on those calls. So seeing that our call volume is primarily non-emergency calls, um, we do have this need for additional call takers to be able to help with that workload. So we were kind of talking about call volume and I wanted to give everyone an idea of what our call volume actually is for the year. Here we have a graph that shows that our calls that were processed for 2022, 128,490. So this includes uh, 911 calls, incoming non-emergency calls, outgoing non-emergency calls, and our text to 911 calls as well. So that's a big number. Kind of want to go a little bit deeper into what does that mean for an average day. So we looked about halfway through the year. Again, we didn't want to pick Liberty Fest because that would be a little bit higher volume. June 13th, 2022, it was a Monday. We kind of broke down the call volume here. We have a day shift and a night shift. Um, our dispatchers work 12 hour shifts. Day shift is 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., night shift 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. So kind of looking here at our emergency calls, those are 911 calls, the non-emergency calls that each shift took. Overall for that day, those two shifts took 500 phone calls. So again, that's just kind of a number. We want to get a better idea of that day and those 500 phone calls. Just to give context to that, so with four dispatchers, that's if we're fully staffed, you're talking about 125 phone calls. That's, that's a lot. And then if we're not, we're at minimum, which is three, that number jumps up mm -hmm. quite a bit. So that's, a, that's just on a Monday. And all of our dispatchers are cross-trained, which means everyone knows how to work the police radio, the fire radio, and do call-taking duties. And very frequently, our dispatchers who are on the radio are also call-taking at the same time, so they're multitasking those two jobs at once. So looking at the call volume breakdown for the same day, we have calls for service, um, like runs for the fire department and for the police department. And not every phone call turns into a call for service because sometimes we're just giving directions or we're giving some information to a, a citizen. But looking at all this, um, these, this is everything that would have follow up beyond that. So we take calls, we also have to enter in calls for service and then dispatch appropriate units and then keep track of the status of those units that are on those runs as well. So if we look at this, even just looking at the fire department, that one for the medicals, there's 24 medical calls that came in. 
So 24 might not seem like a big number, but think of 24 people, 24 people in a room, and every one of them having some kind of medical issue where it was an emergency and they had to call 911. They're having the worst day of their life. That person on the other end of the phone is trying to calm them, keep them together before the ambulance arrives on scene. They are spending time going through the medical protocols with them. They're going through the pre-arrival instructions to make sure that that person stays safe and make sure that our responders, responders are in a safe position once they arrive. Those calls take a lot of time. Um, and we kind of mentioned before, they take time, but the other calls keep coming in. So the less people we have staffed in that room, the better the chances are that that person who's having that medical emergency is gonna to have to be put on hold at a certain point so then another call can be answered, that person goes on hold, and then going back to the original person. And if I am in a crisis, I'm in a medical crisis and I'm alone, I need that person on the line to keep me calm and to keep me <laughs> grounded. So it would, could be frustrating being put on hold, knowing that responders are on the way but not having that person to talk to and kind of help me through that situation. Just one of the things to bring up, so to understand the structure of that room, we have four dispatchers. So one dispatcher is assigned to police, one dispatcher is assigned to fire, one dispatcher is assigned to prisoner care, and the other is an administrative, they do all the paperwork. So amongst all the different things that are going on, as they're answering the phone calls, we still have prisoners underneath our care, and we still have PSAs that are back there. And so the, the dispatcher that's in charge of the prisoners wears two hats that day. They're kind of the overflow for the police and fire, so they're answering calls, and literally at the same time, they're looking in the windows over their shoulder to make sure that the PSAs are processing people properly, to make sure that they're putting them in their cells properly. We have to prisoner care, feed, medical, anything else that's going on. So they just, um, it's just incredible to watch them multitask. It's, it's truly amazing to watch them be able to do that. And one of the things that strikes me through my career um, is that we've only had one dispatcher retire from the dispatcher room and uh, that troubles me deeply. And I look at the, um, one of the things being on the peer support team I talk about a lot is death by a thousand cuts. It's just not that one incident that you see on TV. It's a lot of it's cumulative. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine showing up to work, knowing that you have a hundred phone calls ahead of you, knowing that you're responsible for the prisoners that are coming in. Erica talked earlier about it, just about the weight and the responsibility of making sure that you put those, those chess pieces where they need to be, that way the fire and the police department could be successful. And so it's, just something that I look at. We also have, on the fire side, we also have one expectation for every dispatcher that answers a fire call or an EMD call, and that's that they do it in a certain time frame. So we, we really have an expectation of 60 seconds for them to process this medical information and get it to the firefighters to get them out the door as fast as possible. And as she mentioned, the emergency medical dispatch program bites us in that every time because it's a computer program that you need to be familiar with and how it operates. But there's always gonna be somebody, it's a dispatch supervisor, a deputy fire chief, fire chief. Someone's always looking at those times too. So that's that other added stress to that position that when the phone keeps ringing and they have these other parts in their head, it just, it, it makes it very challenging for them. Just to add to prisoner care too, I, I always try to, throw this in any way I can just because I've noticed it over the years or the police department and the fire department and their help have become the advocate for prisoners which is odd because we're the same folks often trying to put someone in the jail and um, those folks making sure they're fed all that type of stuff is just basic care but getting their warrants uh, for a lack of better terms harassing the prosecutor's office to get stuff done in a timely fashion so we can get people in and out in some type of just manner. That's a remarkable job too. So I think it should be noted. So. Thank you. All right, the last part I have here is called an APCO staffing study. There are two national organizations related to dispatch. There's APCO, the Association of Public Safety Communication Officials, and there's NINA, the National Emergency Number Association. So APCO did a study um, called Project Retains, and Retains was looking at staffing in dispatch centers. It's hard to find staffing studies for specifically dispatch centers because it's a very unique environment. Um, there's call centers, but call centers aren't quite the same as what our dispatch center needs to do. So the closest study I could find was the APCO Retains project. 
you'll see on the slide, it's an overview. Um, and then uh, there are handouts that kind of go through each different section that explain the study itself. At the top, it has the total call volume. Uh, we used 2022 statistics, uh, 127, 835. That's slightly different from the other slide that we had because the other slide also included our text to 911. APCO didn't account for the text to 911 because that's something specific to our center. Not all centers have. Our average call processing times, um, our hourly processing capabilities, and then we look at our current staffing. Again, this is simplifying it um, because everyone is cross-trained and everyone's always helping each other out and there are additional responsibilities. But if we look at it as coverage positions, coverage positions are positions that we have to have 24-7. I have to have a police dispatcher on that radio monitoring that radio 24-7. I have to have a fire dispatcher monitoring the fire radio 24-7 because at any moment those two radios could have a responder key up and they need help and they need assistance and someone has to be there to hear that and react to it. And then our volume influence positions, it's called call taker. Um, but as Captain Biley mentioned, they're doing prisoner tasks, they're doing um, tasks with the court, with the prosecutors, they're doing additional administrative work, they're doing data entry work. So there's a lot that goes into it, but the best we could do was simplify it into those three positions to try to break it down and look at it. So our current staffing, we'll look at four police dispatchers, one for every shift, we have four separate shifts. Uh, four fire dispatchers, one for every shift and then 10 call takers, which puts us at our current total of 18, which is where our, our staffing is right now. Going through the study, um, our estimated needs were 6.92 for our coverage positions and 6.15 for our volume influence positions, which put us at a total need for 19.99 uh, dispatchers, which we would round up to 20. And that would be the two additional dispatchers that we are working towards. Just a quick overview of the, the staffing study. If you're able to open that up to worksheet A, that's the breakdown that shows us the net available hours that an employee is able to work. So that's looking at your public safety service officers, their total hours for one full-time employee, and then looking at various leaves. Um, we looked at 2022 numbers to find the average vacation and holiday leave that dispatchers used. We have average sick leave, personal leave, training leave, military, FMLA, lunch breaks things that you don't really think about, but they do take time, and they take someone away from that council and away from helping out that room. And we came up with the total unavailable time, which then gave us the net available time that they are able to work. And then that number goes into additional calculations. If we go to worksheet B on the flip side, uh, that's looking at our turnover rate. We talked about the demands on that room. Additional staffing will help our turnover rate because then we're taking some of that stress off of everyone and we're dispersing it to other people. So now I don't have to necessarily have my police dispatcher also answering 911 calls. I don't have to have my fire dispatcher helping with those overflow calls. I have an extra person in that room that can take off some of that burden. Um, and then hopefully we would have some additional PSSOs retire from that room because they're not getting burned out and they're not leaving that room. This is a career position and this is something that they want to stick with and that they are proud of. Worksheet C goes over the needs for coverage positions. Um, it kind of breaks it down regarding the number of positions that's needed for a 24 hour period, number of hours per day needed to be covered, number of days per week, um, a number of weeks in the year, and then the total hours needed to cover that position. And then looking at the net available work hours, um, that plays into it as well as our turnover rate, which puts us at 6.92 estimated need for staffing for that position. That's for the police dispatcher, and then it is the same for the fire dispatcher because, again, we need one person to cover that position 24-7, and it breaks down the fire dispatcher and worksheet C there. Uh, worksheet D goes over our hourly processing capabilities, so how many calls can we take? Based on our average telephone busy times, our call completion times, our processing times, and then it looks at our hourly processing capabilities. Uh, worksheet E looks at our volume positions, so how many call takers do we need based on our call volume, and that breaks that down, which at the bottom goes down to 6.15. <coughs> and then worksheet F, is again the, the PowerPoint slide where you look at your total call volume, your processing time, your hourly processing capabilities, our current staffing, and then our estimated needs. 
Are there any questions on that? I know it's a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's very clear. <laughs> what does NAWH stand for again? Well, National Association of... Uh, NAWH is the net available work hours per employee. Okay. So this tool that you've gone through the survey, where did you acquire this tool from? So this was provided by APCO, the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials. Um, they did this project, Project Retains, and this had the, the staffing study, which you were able to plug our numbers into to see what our staffing needs were based on the study that they had conducted. I'm very impressed with this. So we can use it for other things, right? <laughs> <laughs> essentially, I'm thinking myself, like, I would love to have a tool like this. I was thinking the same analogous, thing. Analogous, <laughs> comparable this is, for other things. This is Really well done. Yeah. Very, I'm very impressed. Erica, do they provide certifications for certain things in dispatch too, correct? Mm -hmm. APCO? Yeah. Um, APCO does our public safety telecommunicator training, which is a 40-hour basic class that's required by the state. Um, they used to do our EMD protocols, but they didn't have a computer-based program, so we moved to Priority Dispatch for our computer-based EMD and EFD certifications. Thank you. So we're, pro oh, we're proposing Sorry. two new PSSO positions for 2024. Um, looking at salaries for 2024, the two positions would be 83,104 for each position and finance is reviewing the budget options for that. All right, well, I told you and staff would keep this short today, so <clears throat> I'll wrap it up quickly here. But um, obviously, thank you guys for spending a Tuesday evening with us again. Um, and, and thank you to the staff for putting all this together, they always make us look good, right? It makes it easy for us. Um, but you can see things have changed a lot in 28 years since, you know, I was working in dispatch and writing stuff down on cards and, you know, answering one phone every hour, right? Um, just the police dispatcher and no fire dispatch. We've really thrown a boatload of work towards dispatch. And in in, you saw 20 years, but really in the last eight years, um, Deputy Chief and I have made a ton of changes in dispatch and expectations that we've set that we've never had in the past. And with this computer um, <clears throat> systems and all the different things, the, the blue card, all these things, I can't imagine doing the job. I, I, I be honest with you, it was the most stressful job that I had when I was working here, um, was working in that dispatch center for nine months before I became a firefighter, right? Um, and so I can't say enough for the dispatchers and to thank them for the stuff, because they really do. They're, they're our front line. They're that first, you know, voice that somebody hears. They're the, the, you know, getting us en route as fast as possible, keeping us safe, doing all the things that we need to do. Um, and we didn't even touch on a lot of the stuff that they do. I mean, there's, there's so much you can't get it into an hour. Um, and I'm thinking of like all the things that, um, you know, the, the fights with prisoners and the, you know, the food and making sure, I mean, there's just so many things that go into the dispatcher and the importance of having them um, knowing that when we're on that radio inside of a structure fire and, um, <clears throat> you know, we can make that, that call and somebody's gonna answer that and get us the help that we need, right? So all of those things make a big difference and even, um, the Red Center, right? You know, she talked, just touched on that a little bit. You know, it's, it's one sentence up there, but that's a huge undertaking. So that's the Mabus, like when we got, you know, out to Michigan State University, all that. So they'll be, they're in charge of dispatching the entire state, right? For fire department stuff when it comes down to it. And we're the backup to the airport. And like they said, those things happen. Like when Dearborn went down, um, we're going to get those backup calls, and they're the backup to the entire state for the fire service as well. So that makes you know a, a lot of a lot of work for them um, that they have to train up on, and they have to keep efficient on, even if they're not using it every day. But to keep it in the you know respect of time, um, I don't think there's much more to say. I think that they've they've done a great job of, of explaining our needs and the growth that we've had here, and we and we've really addressed. I think police and fire have done a great job of addressing our staff needs and we bring them to you and we tell you about them. And um, you haven't seen us here talking about dispatch and I think we've failed in that, that respect um, over the past several years of not representing the dispatch as much as we should. So with that, um, I recommend that we move forward with um, these two hires um, for PSSO and that supervisor position.
So as I understand, it's two, two supervisor positions. We have two now and you need two more, is that right? Oh, no, so currently we have IT and dispatch supervision combined. Uh -huh. Me and my partner both do both jobs. Okay. So we'll be looking at taking IT and making it a separate, so one person for IT, um, because the IT component has grown so much over uh -huh. the past six years, and then having two supervisors. Two, so you one one more, okay. Yeah, two dedicated supervisors, and okay. then also for the PSSOs, two PSSOs which wouldn't be supervisor positions, they would be the dispatchers in the center. Yeah, I, I, was, I was very, I, I learned a lot today, mm -hmm. especially from you, Erica. And um, it's, it tells me that, you know, we have learned in the past about our fire department and police department, our very lean departments that we have. And it looks like the dispatch is like even leaner. And uh, you have made your point here about why you need this and Thank you for educating us on this. Of course, thank you. And you can see why the police department's mad because I stole Erica for a fire department. <laughs> <laughs> That's really what this comes down to, to be honest with you. This is why we're here today. <laughs> Big fight. Uh, well, thank you all for presenting this to us. And um, I don't think I've been in the dispatch center since my first year on the board. So. And now that it's redone, I'd love to go in and see it. Almost I think all of us. Okay, Almost. well, when it is, when it is. <laughs> and yeah, if we've built six seats, we might as well fill those six seats, um, especially if at some point we have another fire station coming down the line. Um, and just the fact that in 20 years, with the growth in this community, that we haven't done anything about the, the increased stress level that that puts on these individuals. I mean, we wanna keep you all, and we wanna make sure that you have quality of life. So I think that's an important thing. Now, last week we did pass a resolution thanking you, so I was kinda of hoping that that was gonna be enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, we just thank you. Yeah, come on, isn't that? <laughs> but, <laughs> But no, I, I, I understand what you're communicating to us, and so it, it seems like the right way to go. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. You go. I was just going to say, I was looking at the data. Um, I think it was on the slide where you showed how many calls came in in one day. And that was like really jarring to me, looking at those numbers and knowing that each one of those people deserves to have someone that's calm and experienced on the other end of the call. and you know, able to handle an extremely stressful situation. And so having been on that side of the call before a few times, you know, that just really struck home for me. So thank you for providing that. And the other thing that I was thinking of, those calls take a long time. <laughs> those are not quick calls. And so we need to make sure that um, we are appropriately staffed to give the folks in Canton the service that they deserve. Okay. Yeah, so, oops. Um, I kind of echo what everyone else says. I know, um, you know, often, well, always, usually, you're the dispatchers are the, the first people that people, t uh, that residents or anyone needing help speaks to um, when they try to make contact with police or fire. Um, sometimes you're the only people that they talk, that they have contact with because they a call doesn't need to come out to them but um, you know it's important that that contact goes smoothly and professionally and um, that people feel that you care about them and I think that really is the goal and um, I think we all feel like we need to make sure that um, you know, that our residents are served well, and I think you do serve them well. I know my neighbor called last week because there is a strange car that keeps driving through, or actually it's a truck that drives through our neighborhood on garbage days, and it doesn't have a license plate. So she called, and whoever she spoke to said, oh, we'll send someone next week on Thursday and, and check it out. So, you know, she had that contact didn't need to have someone come right away. It was, you know, obviously a non-emergency call, but those calls are important too. And, it, it, you know, she was very impressed by her professionalism and the caring attitude that she experienced when calling. So I think it's, 
you know, it's really important. You're your, the first contact. Um, I do have a question that's probably more for the directors and it's probably gonna show my ignorance, but just wondering, um, these positions you said were proposed to be in the Canton Command Officers Bargaining Unit, but um, going to be 70% paid for by police and 30% fire, is that right? Is there any issue with that funding with it being in the Canton Command Officers Bargaining Unit? I don't, I don't know if you know more about the contracts. Chief, or Chief, Chief. Um, I, I don't think there'd be an issue from the township's perspective. Um, and, you know, if, um, if the bargaining unit, you know, is willing to, to accept these, you know, two new individuals into their unit, um, then I think, um, you know, that's a decision that is really up to the bargaining unit. And I'll add this, like, if you're thinking like fire has an issue because it's on the police side, um, they've always been in POAM, the dispatchers, um, so we know that. Um, and fire has never had any issue with having them in a different bargaining unit than us, as long as the deputy chief and myself have a say inside that room. Um, that's what we're really looking for. Okay. We also are having, uh, Wendy Trumbull is exploring using 911 funds for the two supervisor positions, so that would uh, keep it neutral for police right. and fire. Okay. Other questions or comments? Michael? Oh, that's just the thumbs. Um, I don't know. This seems like a reasonable proposition. I, how does the supervisor's office feel about it? <laughs> sure. I just actually have a couple of questions. I don't know if Chief, you had, you had anything to add or, okay. No. Anything else, Michael? That's it. So for the words. technology part, you had <laughs> talked about um, the cameras and things like that. And I know with the dispatch center being redone, you know, the cameras were one of the big issues that kind of a time constraint. So even though we have Victor, how would this person work with Victor in terms of making sure that we were consistent, like with some of the equipment throughout the township to make sure we we're using the same providers and things so that we don't have, so we have redundancy? I think uh, what's nice about the current person in that position, he came from IT, mm -hmm. so he has a history there and his working relationship and our working relationship with Victor is outstanding. What we're learning is, um, I think the whole township's learning is that our standards have are been improved by Victor coming in. What we weren't used to is being so conscious of the type of cameras to put into the township. And I think that's another project that I don't know how far this board has got into, but in the future is the replacement of those cameras, how we monitor those throughout the uh, the township, including all the township properties, is a bigger question. Um, but having this person in place on the public safety side will probably leave some of the work on that side. So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, for many, many years, our, all our systems work in concert with the IT department. Mm -hmm. so. okay. I'll add to that. I'll just say that I think that what we've learned from the construction over here is that um, communication is key right and so we need to have that communication with IT um, and I'm not saying between myself as a director to director I think that IT needs to have that communication with our IT so that they're getting the things that they need because we can't do it all at our level right um, we can't watch over everything but they have to have, be able to have that communication and I think if we have that communication with a position like this um, it will just make sure that that transition is always smooth because we lost a lot of stuff during that, you know, construction project that could have been a lot better with just some simple communication. <laughs> now, what about even just the software? Because I noticed you had listed on there software updates and things like that. Do you have to make sure it's compatible with Victor, like you're saying? It really depends on the um, on the software itself, because right. like police um, use different software than fire. Um, some of our software. Um, we don't even go through IT with it, right? It's, it's cloud-based and it's paid through, through a whole different um, means. Um, Victor knows that it's there. Um, Joe knows that it's there. Um, but it really depends on the, the type of software. Good. And a lot of our applications um, and are dictated by, you know, um, one would be uh, CGIS information that's dictated by the, the FBI. 
Um, so a lot of stuff that we do there, and actually Joe Kaczynski is really well versed in a lot of that stuff, so we, we've worked with him for many years on those items. But our records management system, too, that, that is a large system that's maintained by the Public Safety Department. So. Okay, because Victor and I met with the um, state of Michigan con contractor today on cybersecurity. So, you know, so they, it's interesting that cybersecurity ends up there, even though it's not just police and fire. You know, it's under the Michigan State Police, but it's, it's everything. So, yeah, those lines of communication, like you said, are important because we have to make sure everything talks to each other and we don't leave any cracks. And it's secure. Yeah, it stays secure. I have a, I have a question on the IT thing. So, um, you were the supervisor, or, you know, there were two people who were doing IT dispatch. Do you have dedicated people in your department that does IT? For these, you know, these cameras and things like that. I understand you work with the ITI department, but. So right now my partner, he focuses more on the IT, but also has the dispatch responsibilities. Um, I try to focus on the dispatch supervisor responsibilities, but I also am able to be a backup to the IT. But it's all systems that are specific to public safety. And so you also have to be knowledgeable on, apart from dispatch, you also have to be knowledgeable on IT too? That's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And you're talking about even the call time. I remember when my kids were little, I was driving down 275. I think I ended up with a dispatcher from, that would have been the Michigan State Police 911, right? Yeah, they transferred me there. These kids were chasing me, and they were throwing things at my car, and I would get cars in between, and they'd still chase. And I remember calling 911, and that operator stayed with me and probably for miles until I got into my driveway. You know, so that was a long call. Mm. You know, he's trying to make sure that, um, he, where are they now, where are they now, and making sure, okay, get off at the sex said, okay, and so there, he was helping me get there. And you know, that, that was very common because I had two babies in the back seat, and I don't know what was going on with these kids, but it was pretty scary. So I understand that those, that was a calming voice in that kind of a situation, so I appreciate that. All right, but thank you very much. I know you're just like, why does everything happen to you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It's a magnet. <laughs> but thank you very much. You guys did a really thank good you. job. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and I'm sure if anyone has any questions. Also, I mean, we're here. I don't know if it's possible if the board wants to take a look at the new dispatch area, because that's kind of cleared out a little bit, right? If you guys want to look I at it. I can't tonight. But I can't. Yeah. But I would like to schedule a time. Okay. We can wait till it's fully yeah. done. You can take summer down. And, okay. And Kate. Okay, great. All right, great. I don't think we have anybody online for public comment. Let me see. Okay, we have two people. Any public comment at all? Let's see, two, Cheryl and Maureen, do you have any public comment? You can raise your hand. Public comment? No public comment online. No public comment in the boardroom. Nobody is here. All right, can I have a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Support. Support. Motion made by Clerk Seeger, supported by Trustee Snyderman and Trustee Ganguly. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Meetings Thank adjourned. You. Thank you. Thank you.